everyone, and thank you for participating in this, web in this webinar offered by the European School Education Platform, uh, the European Commission's Platform for School Education in Europe. Uh, my name is Maria Lena, and I will be your host for today. Uh, so, for this webinar, we have invited Professor Xavier Bonal, who is a professor of sociology at the Universitat Autonoma in uh, Barcelona. Uh, he holds a strong knowledge on the field of education, educational policies and global development overall. Uh, so uh, today, along with Professor Bonal, we will reflect on the challenges that European cities face uh, in the context of uh, increasing fragmentation uh, and polarization. And uh, he will present us uh, the main outcomes of the, uh, of the project European cities against uh, school segregation. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind you that this webinar is recorded. Uh, moreover, towards the end uh, of the webinar, uh, my colleague uh, Marta uh, or me will share with you through the chat an evaluation form, which we kindly invite you to fill in. Um, last but not least, uh, we invite you to share any thoughts, questions, remarks, comments uh, through the chat, and uh, we will gladly reply to them towards the end uh, of the webinar. Uh, thank you very much again for being here. Uh, Xavier, the floor is yours. You thank can you. also share your screen now. Yeah, immediately I will do. Thank you so much, Maria Elena, for the introduction. And uh, I'm very pleased to participate in this webinar on, on strategies on school segregation. I'm going to share my screen in a moment. If it responds. You, you can take some time, it's OK. Yeah. OK, Great. I hope you can see the screen right you now. You can see it. Yes, right. perfectly. So I, I, I have thought uh, to organize this presentation in two different parts. In the first part, I will introduce basic concepts about uh, what is school segregation and what is the main situation in most European cities. And um, in a second part, I will introduce a recent uh, uh, European project um, was funded by the Erasmus platform. The, the project is called ECAS, European Cities Against School Segregation. It's been developed uh, uh, among three different uh, cities, European cities. And uh, for three years, we work together, research centers and also um, local education authorities in these three cities to design and to and to produce different uh, different tools to tackle the school segregation. So, uh, in the first part, just to start with the with the presentation, um, if I put this image, of course, no one would recognize here um, a European city. It's uh, something more common to see in the developing world. Uh, it's more common to see, for instance, in many Latin American cities that have. Uh, a lot of, of inequalities, uh, high levels of inequalities is actually the continent with the highest inequality in the world. But uh, what is very extreme in this context, as we can see, is um, a very pronounced residential segregation. We have uh, very close areas that are incredibly different in terms of housing, in terms of services, in terms of facilities. Of course, as we know and we, as we can imagine, this is one of the main causes of, of school segregation that is actually affecting uh, most uh, uh, cities around the world and also the European cities. But we cannot reduce, and that's one of the main messages today, uh, we cannot reduce the question of school segregation to the problems of residential segregation. Of course, the, the relationship is very strong, is very pronounced, uh, where we have schools in territories in territories that are extremely poor, it's it's very common, of course, to find high levels of concentrations of children with learning difficulties, of children from uh, ethnic or social uh, or low income groups, and then in the other in the other side, in 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 upper class neighborhoods, of course, the the conditions of schooling, the the number also of the of private schools, it's much higher. This relationship is of course unavoidable, 
What is uh, less clear is to understand that this is the unique relationship that exists between residential segregation and school segregation. There's many aspects that actually intervene in the reproduction of a school segregation, and many of them have to do with education policies themselves. That's one of the main uh, interesting aspects that we have dealt with in, in, in the project that I mentioned before, which is the importance that we give to education policies themselves as strategies that can sometimes help, sometimes uh, induce uh, processes of, of school segregation. In terms of definition, it's very uh, easy and common to identify uh, school segregation as something very simple. We understand school segregation as processes in which we have a lot of intra-school homogeneity, so schools that really share a very similar type of pupils in terms of social class, in terms of ethnic groups, in terms of sex, for instance, in terms of different variables, which is accompanied by inter-school heterogeneity, so uh, strong differences between schools and uh, strong similarities and strong commonalities uh, within the schools. And this type of definition, just to make it clear as a concept, it's good to identify that the, the, um, um, the question of who is very important. So we have two, two main implications to take into account here. We talk about segregation of whom. The first thing when we define segregation is to identify a group that is segregated. It can be migrant students, it can be Roma children, for instance, low socioeconomic status students, girls. So we should to identify the group. The second variable that is important, the second implication, is to identify the territory. Strictly speaking, when we talk about segregation, we cannot talk about schools as segregated as such. Schools can have levels of concentration of an ethnic minority or Roma children or whatever. But when I talk about segregation, I always have to refer to uh, a territory. It can be a neighborhood, a district, a municipality, because what I try to measure is the uneven distribution of children with certain characteristics among the schools of that territory. So, strictly speaking, when we talk about, uh, about segregation, we will have to refer necessarily to a territory. It can be in a city, in a neighborhood, in a district. Usually, what it makes more sense is to talk about territories that would be logical to think about spaces that it's um, it's reasonable to think about um, um, even distributions of, of different types of students in that territory. If we talk about a country, for instance, talking about school segregation in a whole country, it doesn't make a lot of sense because we actually don't think or we don't, don't actually reflect on distributing students among all the schools of that of that territory. When we talk about segregation also, another interesting thing conceptually speaking is to differentiate between the types of school segregation. Uh, we have uh, important levels of school segregation between sectors, public schools uh, versus private schools. This in some systems is less common because public schools are, are by far the majority of schools. But in many systems and in European cities, uh, that's uh, very much the case. For instance, in my own city, in Barcelona, we have a high proportion of private school and we have a clear social division in terms of schooling uh, of the types of pupils that are enrolled in the public system or are enrolled in the private one. We have also segregation between schools, no matter whether they are public or private. So beyond the school sectors, of course, we measure segregation between schools in a territory. Within each school sector, actually, we know that there are high levels of school segregation. And usually within school segregation, within, within schools, segregation is higher than between school segregation. Another interesting uh, aspect of segregation is that we can measure also within a schools of our classrooms. So not just between the schools, but I can have heterogeneous uh, schools, for instance, that use the tracking system uh, in the in the enrolling uh, of their children. So they have uh, different classes which are classified depending on the performance of students, which sometimes correlates uh, very highly with um, the social background of, of those students. Uh, 
And finally, we have another dimension, which is differentiation within or between uh, catchment areas. This is a bit more complex aspect. Uh, as you probably already know, catchment areas are geographical territories that usually give preference in terms of enrollment to students that are uh, residing, that are living in, in that area. So they have uh, proximity points, let's say, to attend those schools. What happens that if I have sometimes uh, territories or catchment areas that are socially incredibly different, then it's very common that I will reproduce between catchment areas strong differences. While uh, if I have catchment areas that are uh, more balanced in terms of, of social distribution and the characteristics of schools, it will be much more easy to balance the social compositions of those schools. Um, this only operates in systems that have catchment areas, which usually have more than two or three schools within that catchment area. We have cities that have one catchment area per school. This system would not apply, but we have other systems, other, other uh, cities that have uh, territories that include more than one, two or three or five or, or even ten schools, which actually uh, can make a difference in terms of how uh, in, in, in terms of the draw of these catchment areas and the effects it has sobre, uh, uh, on school segregation. So again, when we talk about uh, segregation, we usually will refer to this type of groups, segregation between boys and girls, for instance. Uh, as you know, there are systems that uh, still separate uh, children or some uh, in some religious schools, for instance, can be a common practice. Uh, school differentiation between sexes, um, um, ethnic origin, social class, language, we could add here religion if you like, any other variable that actually differentiates students. Um, what is important, as I mentioned before, is that we are able to identify and to define uh, which groups are we referring to. OK, um, if there's something that is not sufficiently clear, I'm, I hope then uh, after the, my presentation, we will have time to discuss and to and to and to respond to your questions. But let me make things a little bit more complicated. Uh, we have just defined what is the school segregation. We have defined the concept, the different types of segregation. Let me now introduce two different forms of measuring school segregation of understanding a school segregation, which are very complementary, but are very important to differentiate. The first one is what we call isol isolation or exposure, which has to do a lot with the idea of concentration. And the second one has to do with uh, imbalance. OK, when um, uh, le let me just immediately uh, introduce these differences. Uh, when we talk about isolation, we refer that segregation is measured according to the proportion of various groups present in a school. So according to this measure, for instance, a black student attending a school with a very high proportion of other black students would be considered racially isolated. So it's very easy to understand this concept of concentration. I can have schools, for instance, in my city, there might be schools that have over 80, 85 or 90 percent of migrant students that would re I would refer to these schools as schools that are racially or ethnically isolated. OK, um, in the second uh, definition, what we talk about is imbalance, uh, um, which refers to the extent to which specific groups are distributed unevenly across schools. And in that case, I'm not just measuring the concentration if, if it's very high in some specific schools, but how the distribution of students that are in the in that area, in that territory of reference, are unevenly distributed among the different schools. Let me give you one example to differentiate the two concepts, which I think it might be important. Let's imagine that we have a neighborhood that has 75% of migrant students, which would be, of course, a very high proportion. And in that neighborhood, we have only four schools, school A, B, C, and D. E. And you have here in the screen the proportion of migrant students of, of, of the schools of that neighborhood. So you would see that school A has exactly the same proportion of the students of the territory. School B and school D have a higher proportion and school C a little down proportion. This territory 
is clearly isolated, so the level of exposure or the level of isolation of students, uh, of migrant students, is very high, as we can see. But this is not a territory that is necessarily segregated in terms of imbalance, because as you can see, the distances of the proportion of migrant students in each school with regard to the average is not especially high. OK, so we have a very isolated neighborhood, but not especially segregated neighborhood. When I go to this second uh, type of example, I have a school segregation in a in a neighborhood here that has 35 percent of migrant students. And here the differences are much higher between schools. We have school A with only 20 percent, school B with 10 percent, school C with 65 and school D with 80. So this level of isolation is not especially high in this neighborhood, but the level of segregation, the differences among schools are particularly high. I'm, I'm just referring to this difference because it's very important that we, when, when we talk about the school segregation and when we try to deal with the question of a school segregation, it's very important that we try to understand what are the characteristics, what are the patterns of inequality, of a spatial inequalities in a given territory of, or neighborhood. So it's very different the policies that I will have to develop if I have schools that are clearly in an area that is clearly isolated, socially and educationally isolated, compared to some areas that the problem that they have is more of imbalance of the unequal distribution among the schools of the territory. So that's, that is important because you can probably and easily recognize that in your own cities, you can think about territories that have more the characteristics of, of isolation and the second one, the characteristics of imbalance. So when we think about the strategies that we'll have to design to tackle school segregation, understanding the patterns of reproduction of segregation is something that is extremely important. Just as a matter of information, um, the most common index to measure uh, school segregation and to measure imbalance specifically, it's what we call the dissimilarity index. We have also an isolation index to measure uh, whether the, the schools are specially isolated. But this one is very common to measure uh, imbalance or, or segregation. And uh, the dissimilarity index is very easy to interpret. That's a good thing. It, it's an index that goes from zero to one. Zero meaning absence of segregation, means perfect equality, and one meaning perfect inequality. That would be that all children of certain characteristics are all concentrated in a single school. So normally never is one and never is zero, of course. All the indexes move between zero and one. The common knowledge tells us that usually all, if we have indexes below 0.3, uh, that would be a low level of school segregation between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 moderate levels and over 0 0.5 would be high levels of school segregation. The, the, the easy thing about the interpretation of the dissimilarity index is that it's very easy to understand. We uh, consider that the dissimilarity index expresses the proportion of those students that should change the school in order to have a perfect balance. So if we have a 0 0.5 dissimilarity index in a territory, that means that 50% of students should move from one school to another to achieve the perfect balance. Okay, That's just a measure. It doesn't mean that this is a policy necessarily. Okay, I'm just talking about how to measure and how to tackle inequality. I will not have time to go into this, but uh, I will share the presentation with the school education platform and then uh, uh, they can distribute it to you. But um, just in case you are interested in understanding more the mechanisms of reproduction of a school segregation, there is this uh, very funny uh, type of uh, website, website, which is called the parable of the polygons that uh, allows you to, it's like a game, uh, it allows you to play to understand how the mechanisms of segregation operate and it's very easy to uh, observe, for instance, uh, how uh, the, the unhappy triangles or the unhappy squares uh, try, depending on their preferences, move uh, to understand something that is very simple. And that's the main message I want to, to, to hear uh, share with you, which is the idea that um, 
the idea, the simple idea that even if we have relatively uh, levels of tolerance that are very high, let's imagine that um, we have a, a level of tolerance of only 20%, let's say, which means that uh, I will be happy to be in a school uh, when um, students that are uh, like me are uh, at least um, at least uh, are, are at least 80, can be 80 percent uh, even different than me, uh, 20 percent different uh, from me. I would accept, and, and below that, I would change the school, which means a high level of tolerance. When we add these levels of tolerance among all participants that are choosing a school, the final result produces a segregation that is much higher than the sum of the individual preferences. Thomas Schelling, an economist in 1971, actually showed this with a model of understanding how segregation was reproduced. And the question is that if I want to move because I'm not happy with those that I have close to me, uh, I will produce a chain effect which actually will alter the decisions of my neighborhoods too. So what we have here is a system in which one starts moving and the others actually uh, in a chain reproduce this mobility which causes different levels of polarization and school segregation. This, for instance, it's very interesting to understand how the white flight operates. The white flight was a concept that was used in the US when uh, the policies that the Supreme Court actually decided in terms of boozing, meaning taking black children to white districts, enrolling them in white schools, uh, produced a reaction from the from the, the 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 middle classes and the population of flying from these neighborhoods because they were actually perceiving that many black children were arriving to their schools so they opt for going somewhere else to other private schools and so on so just to understand these mechanisms how and uh, why and how school segregation is reproduced i think playing with this with these uh, examples are are something very positive okay let me go because I am concerned about the time too, um, to have time to talk a little bit about ECAS. The ECAS project, as I said, uh, was uh, it ran from 2019 until 2022. We had six partners working together, both research centers and local education authorities funded by, by the Erasmus Plus program with the idea of producing and generating tools that would be useful for local education authorities uh, and to design together actually uh, strategies to tackle school segregation. I will talk later on about the website and it will be uh, uh, very interesting that uh, if you have the time to have a look at it, you can grasp some interesting yeah. ideas on, on uh, what to do. Um, I will escape also this. In the presentation, you have a link to a video that is also in the ECAS website. It's a very short video, it's like four minutes, but it describes uh, with cartoons very basically what is the school segregation and what you can find in the ECAS website and what type of strategies we have developed to, to, to tackle a school segregation. But uh, as it is something that you can easily check at home, I prefer just to escape it now and focus more on some of aspects of the, of the project that, that I want to share with you. So this is ECAS. These are the three cities but that participated in the project, Oslo, Milano and Barcelona as the coordinating cities. The idea was very much to focus on, on, on finding these innovative solutions for local governments and based on the principle of collaboration between policymakers and researchers. So the idea of transferability of knowledge and exchange was very common and very, very present in, in the project. Why we did that, it's easy to understand. We know from evidence also from some interesting research that we are witnessing an increasing residential and school segregation in European cities, both of disadvantaged and, and migrant students. There are some complete analyses about how these levels of uh, economic inequalities in this occasion go together with residential segregation. Sometimes you can have higher levels of economic inequalities that do not translate into residential segregation, but this time this is not happening. We have levels of polarization between groups. We did also because we think that 
there is a clear need to produce knowledge and solutions in a policy domain that many, in many occasions it's characterized by political reluctancy or resistance. So it's not easy that policymakers engage in uh, tackling and finding solutions against school segregation. It's a very sensitive aspect, of course, because we are talking about school choice and these type of aspects, as we, as we know, are very sensitive to, to the, the wishes yeah. of the middle classes, especially. We wanted uh, and we had very clear that the local level is a very important level for developing effective education policies and particularly when it comes to ideas that have to take into account very much the context in which uh, inequalities are reproduced, the potential of mutual learning uh, and also, of course, uh, that was an opportunity to position the struggle against the school segregation at the forefront of European education policies. Uh, at the end of 2022, the, the end of last year, we organized an international conference in Barcelona. We joined not only the participant cities, but many other European cities in that conference to, to share experiences and to learn, to, to have spaces of, of mutual learning uh, against the school segregation. Um, just for you to give a, a very snapshot uh, of the, the three cities, we chose these cities also because they are different models of reproduction of a school segregation. I'm just taking a few minutes uh, about this, uh, the description of these three cities, because I think it's very important that we reflect on what are the characteristics of uh, school segregation in our, in our cities, because not all of them uh, are reproduced with the same patterns, and then also the strategies that we have to develop, depending on these patterns of, of reproduction, are, are very different. We have first Milano, Milano, uh, it's a free school choice model, actually. So um, what you see in this map is uh, um, a map of catchment areas. Uh, yeah, each catchment area is uh, represents uh, an area uh, of one public school. So I think there's 140 or 137 uh, catchment areas. But families uh, have always guaranteed the access to this catchment area, the school in the catchment area, but also have the possibility if there is room to some other schools to opt for this uh, school outside the catchment area. OK, so we have a free school choice uh, characteristic of a quasi market system, 137 catchment area, relatively low levels of residential segregation compared to other cities high supply and demand of private schools. There are also uh, a significant uh, market for private schools in the city and high degree of school autonomy, which even uh, affects the capacity of schools to um, to uh, offer a higher or num uh, higher or lower number of school places. And uh, these are some of the main patterns of school segregation. We have high difference between the school segregation and residential segregation. Uh, as you can see, and that happens in many occasions, the level of school segregations are higher than the levels of residential segregation. We have an unequal distribution of the private subsidized schools that are concentrated in and around the city center. Milano, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's organized socially in, in rings. If you check the center of Milano, you will find the, the middle and upper classes. And the more you go to the outskirts of the city, uh, the, the, the social level of, of uh, individuals go lower. Um, and then, of course, that generates mobility towards the city center uh, in, for the Italian families. Uh, the idea of the white flight, if they are more mixed with migrants in the outskirts, they move to the center. And half of Italian families and the 40% of foreigners opt out from the local school. That means that even among the migrants, they have high levels of mobility. It's very common because they have this free school choice system. But the patterns of mobility are, are very different. Italian families go to the center, migrant families go to other schools in the periphery. Oslo is completely different. Oslo uh, is the system which is based on geographic location. Uh, the culture of schooling is very much based on a local school principle and limited levels of school choice. So you have an assigned school which depends on when you live. Uh, the city has 115 catchment area, one municipal school in each one of these catchment areas. They have high levels of residential segregation. So the problem is that the reproduction 
of school segregation actually reflects the high levels of residential segregation. The private subsidized schools is very low, as it happens in many, um, uh, with the exception probably of Sweden in many, in many Scandinavian countries, and have a moderate degree of a school autonomy. Here, of course, we have low difference between school segregation and residential segregation, uh, referring to immigrant background, an homogeneous geography of educational opportunities, uh, uh, more or less in terms of distribution, but the, the, the correlation between school segregation and residential segregation is high. School choice mainly uh, um, through residential mobility operates. That means that if you are concerned with going to some specific school, uh, you probably will have to change your residence because otherwise you won't have the possibility to, to go there. They have relatively low levels of opting out of not going to local schools compared to Milano. And of course, there are also some problems of isolated districts, both at the upper and the lower levels of income. And finally, Barcelona, which is a special case because it's, uh, it's interesting because it's something in the middle. Milano is free choice. Uh, Oslo is uh, geographically based systems of allocation and Barcelona is a controlled choice system. A controlled choice means that families have the possibility to express their preferences when they choose, but the municipality in this case has the capacity to balance supply and demand to ensure that educational planning operates in a better way and also to uh, operates with an equity principle. Okay. So in our case, we have a system that includes 29 catchment areas. So the system uh, gives priority if you want to go to the schools within the catchment area and less priority if you go to some other schools outside of, of, the, of the catchment area. Uh, each catchment area might have from, let's say, the minimum number of schools would be eight or 10. The maximum can be over 40. Uh, these catchment areas are unequal in terms of composition. And we have relatively also low levels of, of uh, residential segregation and high levels of supply and demand of private subsidized schools. So the problem of school segregation in Barcelona, one of the main characteristics is what I referred before as inequality or segregation between sectors. And here we have even higher levels of difference between school segregation and residential segregation when it comes to foreign students. You can see that the levels of residential segregation are very moderate uh, and are, they are quite distributed in different neighborhoods of the city, but that doesn't prevent higher levels of school segregation because we have uh, in a lot of differences between schools. We have an unequal geography of educational opportunities. Uh, areas in the in the city center are, um, ex with the except of this neighborhood, are just well off, and these the two extremes on, on the north and the south are the poorest areas of the city. And uh, even we have the, this control ch system of of, uh, of uh, school choice, we have high levels of opting out. Thirty three percent of families opt for the schools that are not of the same catchment area. And of course, we have also the existence of isolated districts, both upper and lower income. I'm just uh, presenting these characteristics for you to, to underline the importance of how context and the type of school admissions policy and the system that organizes how families choose a school and enroll in a certain school are very important to understand how patterns of school segregation are reproduced. So all the instruments that we design, that we uh, think about what's, what are the best policies, have to be always adapted to the context. What works in Barcelona does not work necessarily in Oslo, does not work necessarily in Milano, does not work necessarily in Brussels, does not work necessarily in Berlin. Okay, So every city might have their own characteristics and the interesting thing here is to recognize the existence of different types of models. In ECAS, what we have done is basically, I will not have time, of course, to get into the details of the project, but we have developed the strategies in five main domains. Uh, we have uh, done, um, uh, we have designed policies in the field of planning and admission policies. What, so what type, of, what type of strategies local education authorities can use to plan better uh, uh, the, uh, the supply of schools? 
let's let's think for instance about how to redesign catchment areas it's a very important issue okay or how to or whether you give more points to families when they have to choose if they have lesser income okay or whether you change the proximity uh, priorities in the school access process all these type of decisions are very micro decisions that are very important so uh, we have developed strategies which again are context based to understand planning and admission policies the second group of policies that we have uh, analyzed and or, or where we have uh, tried to develop uh, good practices it's the identification of vulnerable groups and strategies to balance school en enrollment. This is a policy that is being implemented today, for instance, in the city of Barcelona and also in some uh, cities in Flanders. It's very interesting. So the question here is how do we identify children that have special learning needs uh, because they have more learning difficulties or whatever? And what we try to do is to identify how many of them are in a catchment area, in a neighborhood, in a territory, and we try to balance the proportion of and the representation of these students in different schools. So trying to avoid the high level of concentration of vulnerable groups in, in, a, specific, in a specific schools. There are some interesting projects here that it's, it's interesting that if you are uh, interested with that, uh, you can check in the website what type of policies. The website, of course, has so many links to which you can actually get access to and, and get more information. A third chapter of policies refers to information policies that local education authorities can give to families. Uh, probably you are aware that the question of information is very crucial in terms of understanding inequality in school choice and school segregation. Uh, we know that there are some families that are extremely active in the market in terms of gathering information, uh, checking school websites, visiting schools and so on. Others actually do much less or just choose the school that is closest to, to their house. But these are not the only differences. Uh, local education authorities can do much more in terms of how to provide information that can help uh, the, the educational demand uh, behave in a different way. For instance, middle class families sometimes uh, are very reluctant to choose specific schools. The local education authorities can play a role to help middle class families to prevent white, white flight and to maintain them in the territory. That's very important. Or some uh, migrant families or ethnic minorities tend to choose schools like with uh, that that are chosen by by people like them this is very common and very normal that happens so sometimes uh, the administrations the local education authorities can actually help to change this by actually inviting families to choose uh, with more um, to 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 widen the choice set of this type of of of, uh, of families okay so there are many strategies here that you can also gather information about uh, what to do and how to do it the fourth uh, the fourth pillar is uh, re refers to compensatory policies for socially disadvantaged students and schools um, that's very important that we we keep in mind uh, a double strategy when we talk about the school segregation on the one hand all the policies that I referred before have to do with how to prevent the reproduction of a school segregation, how I can plan better uh, the educational supply, how can I identify groups and balance their distribution. But then I have schools that are already uh, segregated, they are already isolated. So how do I develop compensatory policies for socially disadvantaged students and schools that are there? So here we have examples like the magnet schools projects that started in the US and now it's being spread in more European cities. Uh, magnet schools are schools that are usually socially uh, uh, low income, socially uh, with, uh, with many social difficulties and the school actually uh, specializes in some aspects such as um, arts, science, uh, music, whatever. Uh, speciality that actually makes the school particularly attractive for those children that already go. And the idea is also that it makes a difference for attracting also other types of families that usually don't go to those schools. 
So these type of strategies at the school level or at the individual level are the ones that are explored here. And the final uh, policy dimension, which is also very important, uh, refers to new systems of governance. Uh, we think that one of the main problems of school segregation is that there is lack of dialogue, there is lack of uh, common decisions, um, there is lack of incumbents uh, of interest from different sides of the of the educational community. And the idea of developing new systems of governance, new systems of decision making, new systems also of organizing the school system in terms of teacher allocation policies, for instance, can be very interesting and uh, to innovate and to uh, and to go one step forward in tackling school segregation. So these are the main policy dimensions that you can check. We have produced also in the in the outcomes of ECAS a catalog of indicators, course materials and policy instruments that you can check in the website, which are addressed to policymakers, teachers and stakeholders. European guidelines more for policymakers and also educational st stakeholders. We also have developed uh, strategies to face COVID effects because all the projects, of course, happen in the middle of the COVID crisis. And uh, we were really interested in helping segregated neighborhoods and schools on that. And finally, uh, also uh, information strategies that uh, that local governments can can develop. I didn't put here. Uh, I can see now the the, the link, but if you go to ecas.eu, uh, you can easily check the the. Um, sorry, I will stop this here, and I probably will be able to see you all. <laughs> uh, you can easily uh, check in the website ecas.eu uh, all all these aspects, and you can and you can actually well one of the things I can do is also to share with you the 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 website. Let me just show it to you and it will be easier. Uh, OK, this is the website of the project. You have a menu in that part. OK, uh, you have, of course, the description of the ECAS project. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, I put it the, um, the existence of uh, the, the, the training materials that we have. We have different modules and, and the, the, to understand what is school segregation, what causes school segregation, and especially the model, this one, what can be done, is where you can find uh, different types of strategies in the five policy fields that I, I, uh, I mentioned it, I just mentioned. Uh, but here, as you can see, you can have uh, examples about uh, all these areas, uh, school supply and mission policies, information policies. And if you just get into the website, you can have um, first uh, an explanation of uh, what what is doing a school supply to tackle school segregation, and then also a number of initiatives that are mostly from the three cities and occasionally from other cities in which you can actually use different tools it's like a menu in which you can you can uh, learn and you can actually think about whether these tools can be useful for for uh, developing policies at your school or city level okay i will stop here i think because i think i use already 45 minutes almost and i think oh, it would be time for uh, any questions comments you might like to to make on this thank you so much Thank you Thank very you much. much. Uh, so, uh, so we have already some questions in the chat. OK, uh, the first one was before you start presenting the ECAS project. Uh, we have a um, comment here. Uh, how we can ensure that the, seg uh, the segregation mechanisms uh, won't occur? And how can we ensure that the distribution of pupils is not affected by the differences you mentioned, uh, which are the main cause of discrimination? Yeah, yeah, it's a very important and very difficult <laughs> question to answer, of course. Uh, one of the things that you can check if you go into the links of this uh, game that I presented yeah. is that uh, it's it, uh, with the shelling model, it's very clear that segregation is very easily reproduced uh, because if we really start thinking suspiciously about the quality of some schools, 
or I'm talking with my neighborhoods and they are choosing a school which is not the neighborhood school and so on, that reproduces this chain of decision making, these micro decisions that end up producing a macro behavior which is uh, which is uh, much more much more complex than 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 the sum of individual decisions. But the shelling model also shows that once we have a segregated uh, territory or segregated city, it's much more difficult to go back <laughs> to desegregate because then uh, the the level of, of even if I move the levels of tolerance to very low levels, since the city is already very segregated, it's very difficult to change the mobility of, of people. So it's very important to understand that, uh, that uh, we have to be very active when we perceive the risks of segregation. Okay, of course, when we have very segregated, highly segregated territories, we have to intervene to compensate that. But sometimes we are witnessing processes of segregation that can be prevented or can be stopped with more active policies. And of course, one of the main questions, and I think the, the second question was regarding this is, how do we understand the mechanisms of discrimination, how it works? It's very important that uh, the, the public authorities defend the rights to education and the social rights and economic rights of uh, all the minorities. Otherwise, uh, this produces immediately processes of stratification in the attitude and the minds of the citizens. It is, I, I, I always complain when sometimes there's people that interpret that the school segregation has to do with the attitudes of, of, of the people, of the middle class. I think it's very, it's very unfair to say that because in many, of course, there might be some racist attitudes or some highly discriminatory attitudes always happens in societies. But in many occasions, the decisions that have to do with segregation come from families that might say, I am uh, willing to take my child to that school if it really represented the average of ethnic minority groups that we have in the neighborhood. But the problem is that this school has 80%, not 35%. And that's what actually prevents that those families to make the decision. So it's uh, we, we can expect from the attitudes, but we have to generate the conditions for the change of these attitudes too. Yeah, and I think that uh, the support from the authorities is important, important when it comes to these topics. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we had another comment, last question, uh, concerning the Milan slide. Um, if um, Are you basically telling us that this issue has been better dealt uh, in Spain and uh, in Paris? And what this, is this telling us? Yeah, no, I'm just just showing different types of models. There's there's no perfect model here. <laughs> uh, of course, um, having, for instance, if you have a very like Milan or Barcelona, which are southern European cities that do not have especially high levels of residential segregation, if you have systems of catchment area like Milano, which actually favors access to private to, to local schools, um, that would be a, a system that would be good for reducing the school segregation. What's the problem in Milano? That they have such high level of school choice system and they have high levels of uh, oversupply of school places that there is always a way out, okay? One of the things that explains the school segregation is whether families sometimes have uh, uh, possibilities of going, uh, of flying, of going out. And if you don't give them these possibilities, they might be much more resignated to make some choices in the area. Resignated, and it's not such a bad choice. <laughs> because there's one important thing that I didn't have to go through. But when we talk about school segregation and the social consequences of segregation, we always have in mind this fear that uh, especially middle and upper classes might have, oh, if my child mixes with a child that is lower class or is from a micro background, that will prevent the learning process of my child. Well, what we know from the research is that this is not true. In most cases, children that are from middle and upper classes, no, doesn't matter if they are mixed with more migrant or less migrant students, because the social origin of the family explains very much the performance. While on the other hand, it makes a complete high difference for migrant students and for low-income students, because there is the, what we call the peer effects. Peer effects are very important. 
that means that the learning of the chill of children change in depending on the type of peers, the type of colleagues that they have around them. If you have high levels of children with lots of difficulties uh, for learning, lots of difficulties for even understanding the language of instruction of the class or whatever, that makes a complete difference. OK, so I'm not saying that Barcelona is a better model than Milano the other way around. I think all mothers have the institutional history. It's very important to understand. For instance, in Barcelona, it's very important to understand the high presence of private schools are private subsidized schools, but integrated mostly within the public system. But at the same time, they are different and produce differences. And we have a control system. I, I can I can make this critique very clearly. We have a controlled choice system, which is not controlled enough, <laughs> because uh, um, we have always systems of 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 uh, of going out, as we can see with uh, with 33 percent of families actually opting uh, out of the school of the neighborhood school. Oh, well, thank you very much for your comments. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I I have one. <laughs> okay. Um, you presented us three different models. Let's say one from Milan, um, Barcelona, and Oslo. And do you think that the model of Oslo, which uh, the uh, regional model, let's say that uh, children go to specific schools based on wh where they live, mm -hmm. would you think that such a model would help solve uh, this yeah. Issue. yeah, I think there's m many positive things about the Norwegian uh, model and the Oslo model. I think uh, there's uh, in Norway, I don't know whether there is people from Norway that of course will know much better than I here uh, what I'm going to tell you. But uh, what I see is that they value very much the, the question of the community. And it's very important for them also that children, even when they are young, they are able to go to school on their own. So it's very important that distance, uh, and it's very logical. It is they give a lot of value to go to a, a school close to the home. Okay, if you have a system that works like this, and as a typical Scandinavian society, you have uh, more or less balanced neighborhoods with a quality of uh, living standards that are similar. That one could think that it is the perf the perfect model. But I've been working with colleagues from Oslo for the last three years, and I have seen the challenges of some high levels of residential segregation, especially of refugee children. So they have some areas with 30% or 35% of refugee children in those areas. And then, of course, since there is no mobility and nobody would think about buzzing or about uh, changing the location of, 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 uh, of refugee children to other schools, they, they have high levels of concentration. Of of uh, of schools of of these types of children in some schools, so they they also have problems with that. They also have uh, significant problems. Um, of course, if you have high levels of residential segregation at some point, this system it's not the best. <laughs> and then you have also to find uh, um, interesting uh, ways of of dealing with this. It is also the case, and it's very important to keep in mind that even cities. Within cities, we have high levels of heterogeneity and what it can work in a district might not be the same things that work in another district. So we have also to be flexible and adaptable to 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 make decisions in this context. So once again, uh, we see how the overall system of the community or the country affects uh, education also. Yeah, so we Maybe uh, we can sum up that. Um, do you have uh, something to say to sum up? Yes, I think that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's of course this is we we are talking for one hour about a, a topic that is very complex and. But I think it is important to keep this message that of course there are many external causes of uh, what uh, produces uh, school segregation, but there are also. Uh, and many internal aspects that are in the field of education policy. So in the way, uh, there's two messages here. One thing is that it's very important to work together with urban development policies, with social policies and so on. And at the same time, it's very important that we develop the instruments uh, to work better from within the education system, making laws that are more equity driven, 
that uh, uh, developing reforms in the school um, system, school admission systems that are more equity driven, the same with planning strategies, with information policy. So we have a number of tools that can be used and we, and we learn and we know that in some cases uh, they have an effect. Barcelona has currently a shock plan against the school segregation being implemented from 2019. And we know that after four years, uh, school segregation uh, in, in primary education has reduced between 16 and 23%, depending on the territories. So there are strategies that can be implemented and can help little by little to have cities more equitable and more, and more uh, in favor of the, of the right to education. Great, um, thank you very much. Thank you. And since we have no other questions or comments in the chat, uh, we we can end this webinar here. Uh, thank you again for being here with us and explaining us this uh, uh, not difficult issue exactly, but complex, as you said, it's something complex and segregation is a complex term that has a lot of um, components, let's say. So Definitely. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, this was uh, our uh, last webinar for the summer. We will see you all again in September. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Enjoy your summer, your vacation, and take some good rest. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.